Hi there, welcome at this uh, to this GCSE lecture looking at the topic of poverty. This is the second in my series of poverty lectures and this is looking at um, the issues of social exclusion and inclusion with reference to poverty. So uh, here are your definitions. Uh, social exclusion is where a group is not able to take full part in society. They are left out of important aspects of life. Whereas social inclusion is the attempt to include all people fully in society. So social exclusion happens when a group cannot take a full part in society. And this is a problem because those groups will feel marginalised, which means they feel like they're pushed to the outskirts of society. They'll feel powerless, so quite often will fe be fearful from that lack of power and quite frustrated. And they'll be unable to enjoy the benefits of society. And that can create a strong sense of resentment against society. So it really isn't good for, if you like, consensus and cohesion in society. So at this point, I'd like you to have a go identifying which groups in society might feel and be socially excluded. So which groups might feel that they are not able to take full part in society because, I don't know, maybe of poverty, because of racism, because of prejudice. See if you can make a list of some of the groups that come to mind. Okay, great. So I'm going to go through some of the main groups who suffer ex a social exclusion um, and I would like you to make notes on all the different aspects of why these groups feel excluded. So the unemployed, um, predominantly working class, although not exclusively, but yeah, the unemployed, they lack money for leisure activities, okay? Um, whether that's sporting activities, going to the cinema, and they lack the money for socialising, so they can't spend time with others doing social activities, whether going for restaurants, going to the pub, um, or going or to joining different societies, for example. They lack money for the clothing and latest products. They think it can increase a sense of social exclusion because they feel like they don't belong. They might be picked on. Uh, they might be derided for wearing scruffy clothing or like, you know, not having um, an up-to-date, I don't know, phone, for example. And the unemployed lack daily routine. They don't have to get up to get to work by eight or nine. They haven't got a commute. They haven't got um, uh, colleagues to interact with daily. So they lack a daily routine. They don't have those goals that everyone shares mostly, like, oh, I'm on my way to work. I'm going to work really hard when I get there, and then I'm going to go home. And this can lead to a real sense of low motivation and a sense of isolation, which again is an aspect of social exclusion. The unemployed have um, um, quite low status in society. Uh, they're often demonised by the media, particularly if they're on unemployment, unemployment support. Um, they are seen as like benefit cheats, they're seen as lazy, they're seen as useless, you know, that kind of a narrative. And this can definitely impact their sense of self, low self-esteem and increase that sense of powerlessness of not having a, a function in society. And one of the things it's worth mentioning in terms of what happens with unemployment is there generally is an increase in domestic violence in families uh, where there is unemployment because of arguments over money. Um, so, yeah, we know that the working class are more likely to suffer uh, poverty, so therefore an additional strain of someone being unemployed means that they're far more likely to have incidents of domestic violence within those families because of lack of resources. And data does also show that um, those that are unemployed have increased mental health issues, which is not surprising, with a low self-esteem and sense of powerlessness, and also suicide. Okay. And the next group we're going to talk about is ethnic minority exclusion. Um, lots of you should be able to draw from other units from early on in stratification when we've looked at race and ethnicity, also um, education, uh, certainly uh, crime and deviance as well, be able to talk about different experiences of, uh, and reasons for ethnic minorities being excluded. Uh, so firstly, they, um, if, particularly if they're first generation, they might be less familiar with the language of the UK and, and also the culture of the UK. They might not understand uh, or share the same norms and values so that can lead to a sense of isolation. Uh, they can find it much harder to get a job 
maybe again because they don't have the language skills necessary but also because of discrimination possibly racism in workplaces not wanting to give people from minority backgrounds certain types of jobs they can maybe find it harder to fit in with colleagues neighbors and peers they can feel out like othered maybe because uh they wear a face covering uh, a niqab a hijab um <clears throat> maybe because they have to i don't know pray regularly throughout the day uh, maybe because they don't eat the certain foods or maybe they celebrate certain different religious festivals. Um, you know, like, for example, when the, the country goes mad for Christmas, they might feel quite outside of that if that's not part of their faith. So that would increase a sense of social exclusion. Um, I've already mentioned before, yeah, racism in the workplace leads to low paid work and in unemployment. So as well as suffering racism, which can make you feel socially excluded, they're also more likely to suffer poverty, which increases the sense of, of social exclusion, as well as unemployment. <clears throat> and that racism can really make them feel unwelcome. So that those groups might suffer a sense of anime, uh, like they don't belong, that they're not included, that they, they, they do not share the norms of the, the predominant society. And this can be very much compounded by what the media does. The media is very good at demonising ethnic minority groups. They are quite often powerless groups in society. So the media can quite often depict them as problems, you know, the reasons for waiting lists, the reasons for crime, uh, the reasons for, you know, um, not being able to, I don't know, get your kid into the local school. Um, and these are all moral panics, OK? Um, which, if you remember, Stuart Hall wrote about these moral panics, but particularly how um, ethnic minorities are often scapegoated to distract from the wider problems in society. Um, <clears throat> and these moral panics, we see them come around again and again, whether it's about crime, and particularly at the moment, immigration is a massive one. Uh, terrorism is a moral panic we went through um, that led to lots of minority communities feeling like they, 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 were not, they were not welcome within the UK. So that increases their sense of social exclusion. Um, disability um, uh, can also lead to a sense of social exclusion. So there are things like practical problems, getting around, like actually having access to transport, being able to get into buildings. That can make that certainly make individuals and groups feel like they don't belong and they, they can't take part on the day-to-day -day activities that everybody else can because they might be in a wheelchair and they can't get up some stairs, for example. Um, and then there are the attitudes of non-disabled disabled people, which can be quite discriminatory. So they might see a disabled person and assume they are mentally unable. They might assume that they aren't clever. Or they might see a disabled person and assume that they're not going to be able to physically do something because of their disability. So they don't give them the opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of, um, what's the word, like infantilizing them, like treating them like infants when dis disabled adults are not infants. Uh, but they might be treated like that. Um, and that really takes away their sense of dignity and certainly status in society. There's a, a level of prejudice in society, um, particularly, uh, I know, obviously, physical disability. There can be lots of prejudice and make it harder to get friends and get jobs, perhaps. Um, particularly if it's disfigurement, okay, in society, with that, with that can be quite hard to overcome. But a lot of there's a lot of social exclusion for those who've got mental disabilities, if they've got psychiatric disorders, for example. Um, and if people are aware of that, that does really become part of their master status, like a really difficult one to overcome. And that can interfere with making friends and getting jobs, which will include a sense of exclusion because you don't feel like you belong. <clears throat> it is worth mentioning that the Disability Discrimination Act and the Equality Act, so if you can't remember anything, remember that Equality Act from 2010, uh, brought together a range of um, different aspects of legislation and introduced some new elements to prevent exclusion of all of these different groups that we're talking about and allow for more social inclusion, me very much putting the onus onto employers, onto society, onto institutions to, to make their facilities, make their place to work more accessible for people with disability and other groups as well. But there is a big question about whether this is happening quickly enough and is it actually happening everywhere? So, for example, um, in schools, for example, um, not all schools have the money to convert to increase accessibility for all types of all students, particularly with physical disabilities. Um, hospitals, incredible, even though hospitals where lots of care goes on, incredibly expensive buildings to update and modernise and improve accessibility and with limited funding. Then you think about things like restaurants, you think about pubs, you think about old buildings. 
Not all of these places are easily accessible to someone who is physically disabled. The next two I'm going to leave you guys to do up by yourself because we have spent quite a lot of time in sociology uh, discussing um, it, women and how uh, excluded women might feel. Um, we've talked a lot about women in the workplace, think about um, perhaps what happens with family life and women, maybe try, perhaps think about um, how women might feel socially excluded in the public spaces because of maybe... Uh, they're not able to access the same opportunities, be able to act and behave in the same way. And certainly the working class, you should be able to do by yourself. But what sorts of things drive a sense of social exclusion for the working classes? Where might they feel that they are not welcome? Where might they feel they can't take part in the day-to-day activities that everyone else can? Because of their class, but also because of how society views them as well as a social group. So definitely pause the lecture here and have a go at filling out your what you think about um, the social exclusion of men, sorry, of women and the working class. Um, definitely also, if you can, make some notes about how they are, there are efforts to also include these social groups as well. Think about legislation for women, what's been increasing their inclusion, particularly in the workplace, uh, maybe the family as well. And is there anything that's happening in the, for the working class to increase their sense of inclusion? Maybe even within education, is there anything being done to increase their level of inclusion? So pause now and have a go at that activity. Okay, great. Um, Finally, you need to know about the different sociological perspectives on uh, poverty and social exclusion. Um, So I'm going to talk to you first about the culture of poverty. This is largely a functionalist argument. However, um, it's got quite a lot of elements of the new right within it as well, which I'm going to talk to you about separately in a second. So functionalists believe that people in poverty form their own subculture. So remember, functionists are very big into the idea that norms and values uh, determine our behaviour. And they believe people who are in poverty have their own subculture. They believe that people who are in poverty have their own norms, their own values, their own attitudes and their own customs and traditions. And they call this a culture of poverty. So, for example, they argue that some of the poorest in society find a way of living that allows them to survive through deviant norms. Okay, so norms are guidelines for behaviour. So before I go through this with you, can you think of any ways people who are poor can develop norms of behaviour in order to help them to survive when they survive when they are poor? Okay, hopefully you thought of a couple, but I'll go through um, what some of the functionists have suggested. Firstly, they manage to get by on benefits. Okay, benefits are pretty low um, every week or every month. Um, And they manage to get by by this kind of like, I guess, a lower standard of living lifestyle that doesn't kind of conform to um, mainstream society's expectations of what they should be doing. They eat cheaper food, for example, um, less healthy food, cheaper food. Um... Uh, They might entertain themselves through other means um, that might be less expensive than, I don't know, going out for dinner regularly, going on holidays, for example. So uh, the example given here, they might use uh, drugs, which of course have an expense, and they might drink alcohol, which of course, again, has an expense, but perhaps cheaper than maybe, I don't know, going on a holiday to uh, Saint-Tropez or something. Um, one good example, so if you can't remember many of these, this is one that I remember quite easily, is um, one of the things functionalists say is like those who have a culture of poverty are far, far more likely to see acting criminally as normal or socially acceptable or even socially desirable to be criminal because you're getting one over on the system. Um, so, yeah, those within a culture of poverty, that might think actually low level crime is totally fine. Um, and actually shoplifting is totally fine as a means of survival, for example. And finally, the biggest problem with this culture of poverty, according to functionists, is that they, they just have lower expectations. Like They don't believe that they can or they should be living a higher standard of living, so they don't even try to change. And that's really problematic, because groups who share those sorts of norms and values, that sort of subculture, they're not actually that helpful to the wider society when you think about that human body analogy that functionalists use. One of the things they say is that um, this culture is passed on, okay, so children are socialised 
into seeing this way of life as normal. Um, and then they will go on and socialise their children. So this culture of poverty isn't something that just affects individuals in that one time and place. It will be passed on. And like one of the, I, I, sorry, I've already sort of said this, one of the most problematic aspects of this is this fatalistic attitude. If, you, if you've got a fatalistic attitude, you just don't believe you can change anything. It's like, you know, you haven't got any control of your fate. So the poor kind of accept their way of living. Uh, they value, don't value education because they don't believe they're going to ever do better. Uh, they don't try hard to get good jobs because they feel that they can live off benefits or they, can, they won't get them. And this cycle of deprivation continues. <clears throat> so they, if you like, are responsible for their own social exclusion, according to functionalists. Um, yeah, and the poor themselves, the functionists, if you like, blame the poor for having deviant norms and values. It's their fault they're socially excluded. Okay. So now I'm going to talk about um, the underclass, sorry, the new right and their perspective kind of similar to some of these functionalist ideas that we've been talking about but their big idea or concept is the underclass which you will possibly have come across in other units in sociology maybe in family so this guy here is a guy called charles murray um he is a uh, like i said a new right sociologist um and he argued that the poorest in society are actually under the working class so we shouldn't be talking about the working class as being the main problem we need to talk about this subgroup beneath them called the underclass so it's kind of offensive i think that kind of term the underclass um but you know not everyone would agree with me so according to murray the underclass are a problem in society because uh they are responsible they are to blame for their own poverty and exclusion so very similar to functionalism uh, the government and government benefits encourage a culture of dependency on the state. He's really critical of benefits. He says it stops people going out for work. And this underclass group, they see it as normal living off benefits, which, you know, for most people, that's not the normal way to survive. Normally, it's, you know, get a job and work and earn money and pay bills. And he said, yeah, the underclass lack a motivation to work because of benefits. And he believed that the government should get rid of benefits or reduce them. So the underclass have to take responsibility for themselves. But let's like have a chance to think critically of Murray's views. Um, is he right? Do you think he's right that actually the poor have a deviant culture? This underclass group have a deviant culture that's to blame for their own poverty? You know, or can you think of any points to say actually not about, can, you know, can anyone get out of poverty? Are there any barriers to people being in poverty? Think about people who have significant disabilities. You know, if you'd reduce their benefits, is it going to mean they're going to be able to work harder? Probably not. Um, think about perhaps lone parent uh, families, particularly mother, mother, mothers. Are they going to be able to, I don't know, go to work when they've got two kids to look after? So try and think, what critique can you make of Murray's views? You know, particularly the idea that this underclass are not motivated because of benefits, you know. I think if you can see any criticisms you can think of. The final perspective I want to talk to you about is the Marxist perspective, who unsurprisingly is going to disagree with the new right and the functionalist view. Yep, disagree. So they argue that it's capitalism that causes poverty. Capitalism causes poverty. Capitalism causes social exclusion. It's not working class culture. And they argue that the ruling class benefit from paying low wages because they get to keep all the profit. Do you remember that motivation, the ruling class, the business owners? They want to keep as much profit for themselves. And one of the aspects they can do, one of the things they can do to increase profits is pay workers low wages. And the problem is because workers are so fearful of poverty, workers are scared of not being able to pay bills. They're scared of not being able to pay mortgages. They accept the low wages. They don't challenge it and say, this is unfair. Mm -hmm. They accept the low wages. And then these low wages, they mean that the working class is socially excluded. They will spend time making the goods, um, like cars or products or, you know, working in stores and, you know, waiting tables in all these businesses that they can't actually afford to buy these things from. They can't afford to go out for dinner and be served by a waiter. They can't afford a particular type of car. Uh, they can't afford to shop in a supermarket like Sainsbury's, for example, or Waitrose. So they become socially excluded because of these incredibly low wages. But what really increases their sense of social exclusion is the media. 
And it does that in a couple of different ways, really. The media really does demonise working class culture, working class dress, working class attitudes, working class people. They often do demonise the working class. Uh, and that can make them feel that they're not welcome, that they're outside of mainstream society. Hence, I guess, you know, that aspect of them forming a, a, a subculture, if you like, to protect themselves and give themselves that sense of belonging. But as well as that, the media also puts a lot of consumer pressure on the working class to buy products. Well, they put the media pressure on everyone. But the working class, they're not going to be able to buy many of the products the media tells them to consume. And that, again, will include that increase, that sense of social exclusion. They're not going to be able to um, take part in the activities everyone else in society seems to be doing in adverts or on TV shows or in, I don't know, magazines. And that's going to increase their sense of social exclusion. OK, thanks for listening to this lecture on social um, exclusion and inclusion. Um, and hopefully you can join me for my last lecture looking at globalisation and poverty in the next um, series. Thank you.